Great, and I think we can fit a lot more people in here. And after the previous talk, I should say, and now on to a more serious topic, um, uh, you know, fit for somebody like Sherlock Holmes, but we've got Daniel Holmes here. Uh, Daniel uh, has the privilege of being a Python developer by day. Uh, and if you've ever worked with packaging stuff in Python and you never knew which thing to use this year and how to it fits in with all the rest, he's going to enlighten us. So please take it away. Hello? Is that loud enough? Cool. All right. Uh, thanks so much for being here, guys. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, as was uh, mentioned, uh, I'm uh, Daniel Holmes. So I'm a developer for Python and Django uh, at a company called Shareforce. So at Shareforce, we are a, are a startup that has a software as a service that we provide to companies to manage their share incentive schemes. Um, so uh, yeah, without uh, further ado, um, let's get on to the talk. Uh, so what I'm basically going to cover today I'm going to touch a little bit about Python dependency management just to give a bit more context because um, I think there's developers at many levels uh, that are here today. And then we'll discuss uh, virtual environments, look at the different tools, and then make a comparison. And then uh, in the summary, we'll, we'll have a look at uh, you know, what, what tool could be uh, you know, trying to match the tool for, with the use case. Um, and then I'll be doing a little bit of a, a demo as well. So I recently came across, across this quote and I, I thought it, it, uh, fr from a blog and I thought it really, really hit home. Dependency management is like your city's, waste, uh, your city's sewage system. When it's working well, it's easy to forget that it exists. The only time you remember it is when you experience the agony induced by its failure. So a lot of the times we're using our, our tools and dependency management, everything is going well. Then we install a new, a new package. It has some weird dependencies or conflicting dependencies, and then everything breaks, and then we tear our hair out because we're trying to we're trying to manage this. And that's that's just on our local machine. Um, never mind what happens in production. I think this is a very this is a very famous meme because it's a reality. Um, <clears throat> uh, the so in Python we have pip, and pip stands for pip installs packages. And you may ask, but what does pip stand for? PIP stands for PIP installs packages. <laughs> okay, uh, and uh, yeah, very very creative name that. Uh, so if if we just take a look at, um, in Python, if we go and take a look at our site packages. Uh, All right, so the way pip, in, pip, when it installs something, it installs it to the site packages, but unfortunately, there's no way of knowing which version you want to use. So if you have m different projects that are use different versions of a particular package, you have absolutely, pip uh, has, or Python has no way of, of for you to be able to uh, specify which version. All right, so this is, this is a bit of a problem. Okay, but all is, whoops, all is not lost. You can have eight versions of pandas installed if you, if you really want to. Um, uh, and that is done by using virtual environments. All right, so this is a, virtual environments is kind of like a big, a big hack, all right? It's, it's, uh, and some of the tools are more hackish than others, but it works and we don't really have much of an alternative um, when it comes to this. So um, if we, most of, well, all the um, virtual environment tools, they pretty much have an implementation of pip installed in them. So then what you're able to do, say in your first virtual environment, you can create a virtual environment for some data science application. You're using old Python 2.7 with a much older version of pandas and numpy and scipy or numpy and skippy, as some people like to call them. Um, and then maybe you've got a web scraping application. you you using requests and the wonderfully named package beautiful soup. Um, and a different version of pandas and then you've got some serious web application with a new version of python and you can have the most up-to-date version of pandas so you can you can do this thanks to virtual environments um, on different um, projects all right so now according to the zen of python which many of us know there should be one and preferably one obvious way uh, to do it 
not the case with virtual environments, unfortunately. So if we take a look at all these, these are the tools, some of the tools that we have, virtual env, pip env, py env, v env, and py v env, all of those matching that regular expression as you can see on the screen. Now, you know, if, if a bunch of these tools match a reg regular expression, you know this creates a lot of room for confusion. Um, and some of these tools have a bit of similar functions, but they're slightly different in many ways, some of different use cases. So in addition to these, we also have some newer ones called Hatch and Poetry. And then of course you have all the Conda, the Conda, Conda, Mini Conda, and Anaconda, which creates a lot of confusion. I used to think that Conda was only for Python. I think it with this, it's had to do with like the snake, like a like a anaconda and a, and a python. I thought, but yeah. So I've also been there on confused before. So we'll we'll go and we'll discuss um, uh, discuss some of these and, and explain a little bit what they do and some of their pros and cons. All right. And this reminds me of this famous saying: Java is to JavaScript as car is to carpet. All right. <laughs> these tools they have similar names, but they create a lot of confusion, and that's why some of you, if you know Java and you get recruiters contacting you saying, hey, I've got this great position for a JavaScript developer, and you're like, no, no, I know Java, and then they're like, like, what do you mean you know Java? I'm looking for a Java, JavaScript developer. It's the same thing, isn't it? No, it's not. Um, all right, so, yeah, there's a lot of these tools, so what I'm hopefully going to do is you, you, you as the developer can have a look and maybe have a few takeaways, you can go home and say, let me try a few of these, maybe they can help me in the different different projects. And hopefully you won't look like Woody in that picture when you see all those different tools available. All right, um, and then what I'd like to say is, please use virtual environments. Um, <clears throat> you're going to run into problems uh, if you don't. And uh, if you don't want to, I mean, if you insist it works on your machine, we could just ship your machine. I mean... You could always do that, uh, <coughs> but I wouldn't advise. I wouldn't advise that as well. Um, okay, so let's take a look at these tools. First of all, virtual env. I think most of you are familiar with this one. It is the most popular. It's also been around for the longest. So it has Python two and three support. So those of you who are still uh, who are still being extremely brave and still using Python, you've got three months. Uh, sorry, Python two. You've got three months left. Virtual env will still work for you in Python 2. Um, now, one thing that, Pyth that, that virtual env does is that it actually copies, cop makes copies of the Python binaries. It doesn't actually make a link. When you create a virtual environment, it doesn't link to the Python binaries as they exist in your system. So, but I'll show, you, I'll show you an example as we do a demo. All right, so let's just... All right, so... <clears throat> we're going to create a virtual... We're going to create a virtual env. Let's say we're creating an application where we're going to, I don't know, order pizza online. So we'll call our virtual env pizza. All right. So uh, as you can see there, um, we it's gone and it's, in, it's set up pip and the wheel and all those kinds of things. If we take a look at, before we actually go into our, our uh, virtual environment, if we just take a look at pip and see what I have installed, I actually have quite a few things installed in my global Python and Python installation, so in those side packages. Um, but now, if we go into our virtual environment, so, okay, so we've got our, our pizza virtual environment there. So if we go uh, and activate our virtual environment, okay. So we can see it, it nicely shows us a little there that, okay, you're in this piece of virtual environment. And then if we take a look at pip, we see mm, nice, clean, uncluttered, fresh version of, of pip. And now, when we go and uh, run our um, Python programs in this environment, we won't have it cluttered with everything else. So, but if we, okay, so let's just do an example. Let's try and install maybe, okay, we're gonna install requests here. Okay. Okay. Oh, sure. Oh. No. Control plus. How do I zoom in terminal? Shift control. Ha. Ah, great. Is that better? Too big. Shift control minus. No. 
Control minus. What? <laughs> shift control plus and control minus. Shift control equals this plus and shift and control. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> all right. Um, so where were we? All right. So we've got. Um, all right. So even though we just installed requests, we see there's a whole bunch of other other things uh, packages that got installed there as well. Um, now, what we can do now in our virtual environment is that we can then whoops, wrong way around, we can then freeze these requirements and stick them into a requirements file. I'm sure many of you have done this before. So if we take a look at our requirements. Okay, we see we've locked these uh, different versions of the things that we've had, we have installed. Uh, something else that we can do is that we can... Uh, we can create a requirements file for our development environment. So requirements, let's just call it requirements dev. And then at the top, we say, so when you're installing this in your development machine, you can say, pip, uh, you can put this command at the top of your dev file, requirements.txt. So that'll install everything in your requirements file. And then so maybe you are using PyTest equals uh, 5.1.4. Okay, well, it, it, it doesn't doesn't matter for this demo, but you get you get the idea. So then, what you can do is that when you maybe when you when you ship your code and someone or someone else is joining the team, you can then give them the setup, and then they can duplicate your environment with the packages by going pip install our requirements dev. So that'll install all the packages that are requirement required for production and then a few for dev if you're just doing the testing on dev. All right, so that just gives you an idea of virtual env. This kind of workflow is very similar. Uh, you'll see as, as, we, as I show you the other tools, this idea of having this requirements file and, uh, and locking that requirements file. Okay, so let's, right, so that's, that's it for virtual env. Um, oh, wait, before we move on, there's a tool called Virtual Env Wrapper, um, which is really great. So it, it, it offers some, some high-level commands. It makes it a lot easier for you to switch between uh, different virtual environments. Okay, so with Virtual Env Wrapper, you can actually see I have it installed here. Uh, the, there, Virtual Env Wrapper. Okay, so it's a separate package. You have to install virtual inf and virtual inf wrapper. Right, so you can go make virt virtual inf, and let's call this. Maybe you've got that that pizza that pizza delivery app that you're working on in your spare time, and then you've got a work uh, virtual environment that you uh, want to spin up as well. Um, I might add that with virtual inf, you can also specify which Python version. Uh, you want to spin up in your virtual environment. Okay, so another difference, if you'll notice here, with virtual env wrapper, is that what it's done is that you can you can you specify uh, wherever you want a environments directory, and then instead of uh, instead of installing uh, instead of putting that those environment files in a, in in your project folder or that folder there, you have a central place that you can store all your virtual environment files and configurations and things like that. All right, so uh, what you can actually do then is that if you want to switch to uh, your, say in the morning you get to work, you can say work on work, and then you do some, do some dev, and then you get home in the evening, you work on your hobby project, and then you can say work on pizza. Oh, wait, sorry. I created the pizza virtual environment with virtual env, not virtual env wrapper. Okay, so that's one of the caveats is that you, if you're using virtual env wrapper, you have to, you, if you want to switch between virtual environments, you have to create them. So let's, let's just uh, deactivate this one. And then let's make another, let's call this one game. Say maybe in spare time you're making a game. And then you can easily switch between your tools, work on uh, work, and then it'll just switch your Python, and then it's as, it's as simple as that. 
Um, so that's what makes virtual env wrapper really, really useful. Um, so of course, I can't show everything a virtual env wrapper does, but you can take a look. It's very, very useful. All right. Uh, next, we have uh, venv. Okay. Now, venv is part of the standard library since Python 3.3. So if you're still using Python 2, unfortunately, you won't be able to use vnv. Um, now, there's a lot of confusion. Some people think that vnv and virtual env are exactly the same. They do the, exactly the same thing, but the slight difference is that vnv does it right. It does not copy the Python binaries. All right. Now, the problem with copying Python binaries is that if you're trying to package your tool and you're trying to build um, your Python, because it doesn't update the links when it creates a, cop uh, a copy of the Python binaries, it causes all sorts of issues and, and it's just... It, it can cause all sorts of problems. I, we haven't run into those problems uh, because I guess our use case, we haven't needed to actually do that. But we used to use vnv and we've moved to pipenv, but we'll get into pipenv later on. So what I want to show you with, uh, with vnv is that, uh, okay, so because vnv is a Python module, you actually act, act, activate it, uh, run it as a module. So vnv, okay, and let's maybe call this one my vnv. All right, so, uh, okay, so my, my, my vnv is there, so we want to run source bin, uh, no, my vnv, vnv, bin activate, okay, so there we in our virtual environment. Um, <coughs> Uh, okay, I want to show you, let's take a look at, okay, I want to show you here the difference between the, the vnv and virtual env, how the Python binaries are. So let's take a look at uh, my vnv bin. Oh, wait, let me, let me rather do like this. Right, so can you see there, uh, if you can let me just try and scroll, oh, there we go. So you can see there, Python 3, it actually points to the, the user, the actual Python binary in the user folder. Whereas, if we take a look at, uh, let's work on game, and then, actually we don't need to work on game, we, I can just show you. Uh, this one exists in the home folder because it was the envs. Uh, this one was called game binary. There, you see. So the difference is Python 3, 3 po it actually points to Python 3.6, which is just a copy of the Python binary there. So you can see the subtle difference. Right. Um, so using vnv is kind of like supporting your local economy, all right? So buying local, people tell you, no, you should buy local local goods and things like that. It's because it's part of the standard library. It's still, vnv is still kind of coming into adoption. There's still a lot of people using virtual env. Um, but for this reason, I think it is important we can be responsible and use v, vnv. Um, uh, okay, next we're moving on to pipenv. Now, pipenv, uh, a lot of people will tell you, oh, pipenv is blessed by the Python, by the Python gods. Uh, it's only recommended by the Python packaging authority, not the Python core team, all right? Um, so that's, this, that's created a lot of confusion. Pipenv, it's not perfect. Uh, it's a high-level tool, so you can, you can just write very simple commands and it'll do a lot for you. Um, and it's one of its strengths is that it's really, really good at uh, helping you manage your, your dependencies. Okay, so let's, uh, another thing about pipenv is that it's very, it's very focused on like, like, like project based. So with vnv and virtual env, you can perhaps have a single virtual environment for multiple projects. Pipenv doesn't do so well working outside the project directory. It's just the design and the way that, that pipenv was, was managed, uh, was, was, uh, was designed. Okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to create a pipenv environment. 
uh, <coughs> and Pipinvis gives you like a lot of nice outputs and nice information. One thing I would warn you about is Pipinv is very potentially very slow. So if you need to uh, get stuff done in a hurry, um, Pipinv is can be quite slow. So if we have a look at uh, so Pipinv does have pip in the background, all right? Uh, if we take a look at uh, Oh, I haven't installed anything yet. Okay, so <clears throat> let me no, let, let me first show you. So what pipenv has is that it has a pip file. Uh, let's take a look at. Uh, oh, I've already created this virtual environment, so there should be something in there. So pip pip file. Okay, so what I've done, I actually did this earlier on, is that I've gone and installed instead of having separate pi separate files for uh, requirements underscore dev. And just requirements, you can have in a single file, you can have um, in a TOML file, uh, it specifies what versions for development for uh, and for uh, production and things like that. So that's very useful. Uh, another thing it has is the, uh, the lock file. So once you've finished uh, and you're ready to ship, you can then you ship the 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 log file and it has the hashes of the different dependencies um, and uh, for for specified versions. So, oh, whoops. Uh, okay, um, let's take a look at. So, pipenv it has a whole bunch of uh, commands uh, and things. I won't be able. We don't, we don't have time to go into them. But I think it's just important that you know that it's there and it can it it. It, it is quite useful. So we use Pipenv on Heroku, and we've had no problems there. Um, Heroku does a great job of when we uh, when we deploy and we've got new packages, it installs them and it works. It works very nicely. So if you're using uh, Heroku, you you shouldn't have any problems with it with um, with Pipenv. Okay. So uh, moving on. Um, so there is something else called Pyenv. Uh, this is a tool to help you manage different Python versions, so it's specifically specifically for that. But you can have virtual env and virtual env wrapper uh, plugins if you want as well. Um, then you have pyvenv, which is probably the worst named tool out of them all, and that's part of the reason why it got deprecated in Python 3.6. So you can forget about uh, about vnv. It tried to uh, it tried to be like virtual env wrapper for for vnv, but it, it didn't it didn't work out so nicely. All right, then you have Conda, which I think a lot of the data scientist people will be familiar with. So with with Conda, it's it's a cross-platform package uh, uh, um, installer, and uh, it's language agnostic. So if you have a multi-language project that uses Python and a bit of other things, Conda is a good environment for that, um, and it can replace your virtual env. So uh, Another thing is to mention that Miniconda is like it's uh, it's comes packaged with a Python interpreter, and uh, Anaconda, which is the full distribution, is like three gigs worth of stuff. If you want to, if you feel like installing all of that, it like takes care of everything for you. So if you if you say on 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 Windows, Anaconda works quite nicely on Windows. If you want to get into data science stuff, you can just download all of that, and it's all there running for you, and it's it does a lot of stuff for you. Okay. So the question is, which tool should I use? It depends. Okay. Uh, so virtual env, I'd say you can use that for general general Python development if you're doing Python 2 and 3. Pipenv, if you have a lot of the project workflow type of thing and in web development, Pipenv seems to work quite nicely. Uh, Pyenv, if you want to manage multiple Python versions. Uh, Venv, also, like I said, same similar to virtual env, except it only works in Python 3.3 and above. And then Conda, if you have multi-language projects, data science, or you want to be cross-platform. So the other tools, uh, which are kind of, they try to be like, well, they, they try to overcome some of the shortcomings of Pipenv. So Hatch has packaging support, which Pipenv doesn't. So if you want to, from your project, you want to publish it on uh, the Python uh, packaging, um, Hatch does have some support for that. The same with Poetry. Um, 
Poetry has better dependency resolution than Pippin. It doesn't make as many assumptions about the different versions that you want to uh, that you want to install. Like when you specify, it like almost forces you to say, okay, you've said Pippin install requests, but which version do you want? It doesn't just assume, oh, you're happy with any version. All right. Okay, so it it pretty much comes down to this. These three tools is a, it's a shootout between these three tools. So I would encourage you to go to go and uh, try these out. Um, I think uh, Pipenv and VNV are pretty easy just to uh, just to try it out. Go read up about them, um, and uh, yeah. So just to summarize, we have, uh, like I said, the Python standard library. The way dependencies are managed and resolved, it's it's not great. Um, I don't think when when Python was designed, they didn't consider multi projects and, and things like that for whatever reason. So that is necessitated the need for virtual environments and. Uh, Obviously, there's many, many tools. It creates a lot of confusion. Hopefully, from this, uh, you would have got a better idea of what these tools are and the differences that they uh, that they have. Um, uh, but of course, there's not enough time to go into all of that. So hopefully, this has given you an idea, food for thought, and think, hey, maybe I can manage my virtual environments better by using a different tool. And uh, I would recommend these three tools. Uh, VNV is kind of like the, the stable standard library guy. Pipenv is the new kid on the block, and Conda, he's like also really, really stable uh, option. All right, um, so this is just the summary with the pros and cons. I think you guys will be able to get access to the slides at, after. Yeah, so you can go have a look at that. Um, but other than that, uh, thank you so much. Great, thanks, Daniel. Any questions? I've, I've got a quick one for you, maybe, in the meantime. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about installing stuff using, say, pipinv as root, so that other users can use it in a virtual environment? Mm, I don't know. <laughs> uh, uh, I've never thought about that, actually. So, But you can, you can give it a try. <laughs> Just not on production, yes, yeah. <laughs> Is there anything else? <laughs> Will you maybe comment a bit on how these play with uh, various build tools? Uh, and also, thanks for the talk, it was really cool. <laughs> um, I can't comment on how they play with various build tools. I haven't had much experience on how, uh, on that. Oh, you mean you mean like, uh, like, like uh, IDEs and stuff like that, or? Okay, yeah, so, so IDEs, particularly PyCharm, they've got, uh, and also VS Code, they actually do work quite nicely. You can specify which virtual environment you're using, and then it can, it can detect that you've got new packages installed. It actually reads your requirements file or your pip file and things like that. So, yeah, working with other tools, uh, I know VS Code and PyCharm, they do, qu they do work quite nicely. If you go and uh, fiddle around there, you can find it's, it, they do work well. Hi. Oh, yes, uh, you told us about the, the advantages of virtual environments. What are the disadvantages of using a virtual environment? So, uh, the disadvantages, well, I guess it's like, yeah, it's, 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 it's a necessity. So, the disadvantage is that you kind of, you have to, you have to manage them. It's like you, you, you have to have it, but you, you have to manage it. It's like, like your sewage system. It's, you have to have it, you, you, but you just have to manage it, manage it properly. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's at least my perspective on what the disadvantage is. is that, well, uh, the one disadvantage, obvious one, is that there's been so many different tools, and there's not one obvious way of doing it. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, so, I mean, virtual environments have been like, very useful for me on like, my personal machine, uh, but how do you see the use for them in something like a, a container? Do you use virtual environments inside like Docker containers? Well, yeah, well, I mean, you can, if you've, if you've, got, a, if you've got a containerized application, I don't think you really need virtual environments because you can just install stuff in the global pip install. I, yeah, unless you, unless you want to have multiple versions of Python on one container or multiple environments and things, but I, I yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah. uh, this is a n very newbie question, but um, if you're running a Django app, then 
you said Conda has the advantage of having multiple languages. If it's a yeah. project that has multiple languages, um, Django obviously you have like HTML and JavaScript, but um, would you still be using um, v uh, VN or something like that instead of Conda since you don't really need dependencies mm, with okay, other languages? So when it comes to Django, that's a bit that's that's kind of different because you so like with HTML you don't you don't really like have to install packages and things like that. So Conda is, is to install packages. So say maybe like yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what it, what would be a good example, but uh, maybe you're using Python and like I don't know. Java or I don't know what if someone and and node exactly okay node's a good example because node uh, has uh, you got to install a whole bunch of packages and things like that so yeah I see there's one at the back we use we use Pippin for for our Django and that works that works fine um in uh, in terms of shipping eh because I understand with uh, container you can just push it to a hub and then. Yeah, that's it. So, in terms of uh, virtual environments, how do you uh, manage that? Or how do you just take that uh, local environment that you have and then just ship it to everyone who wants it? So, so uh, that's where the requirements files and the pip files come in, because, um, and especially if you're using something like Heroku Platform as a service, they then go and then they read, when it deploys it on your instance, they then go and read those files, the pip file.lock or your requirements file, and then they go and check and update all the all the all the stuff in your in your instance's Python environment. Um, and then does that answer your question? Yeah, sort of. And then the applications that are in that uh, environment, because I understand with the requirements file, it just has those a list of those packages. So the app itself. Yeah. Uh, what do you mean the app? Like uh Yeah, like what you uh what you developed in that environment actually. I'm not sure I understand. Yeah, 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 I know for sure, exactly. Uh so you can that's why the things like Hatch and Poetry they try and emphasize more on the packaging the packaging side of things. So if you if you are someone who does who does create packages, yes, use the virtual environments, they can they will they are important as part of your part of your packaging. Maybe we can squeeze in one more question. Ah. Hi there. Um, so I'm wondering about best practices around um, version pinning. It seems to be a common thing, um, uh, with specific focus on security, of course. Um, uh, my gut tells me if you pin versions, then you're not going to get your security updates. Mm -hmm. So how do people take, typically deal with that in production environments? Okay, so what you can do, uh, I can show you here. That's a good point. I, I forgot to mention that. So uh, what you can actually do, uh, let's, just take, uh, let, let's just take a look at our pip file, right? With pipenv. The, the principle applies the same to your other, like your requirements file. Uh, so then you can go and you can like pin Say you want to use requests, uh, you can say uh, gr greater than, whoops, greater than or equal to, uh, maybe you know that there's an insecure insecure version or whatever. You can say request version 4.1 or whatever it is. So then it'll always install the latest. So then you won't, you know for sure that you're going to be stuck with everything beyond version, high, higher version. So you can, you can specify that. Yeah, so that's why you run your pip. That's why you have to run your pip file. So that that's that's where requirements, the requirements files and things do fall short. And when you run your 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 lock, your pip env lock, it does uh, go and check what what packages that are sub dependencies they are, and then it, it locks all of those as well. So that's why it it, it pip env is a lot better when it comes to the deterministic nature of your uh, of your virtual environment packages. I hope that answers your question. Cool. Any more questions for Daniel? Hi there. Hi. Um, so you mentioned that one of the advantages of, of pip end was deterministic builds. Yes. Um, we've had some issues in the past. I think just basically what you were trying to do now um, with the version pinning, 
<laughs> what I've noticed before is that the assumption that Pipend makes with the star or the wild card is actually, in my opinion, incorrect because what yeah. I've noticed happening is, let's say you install PyTest, for example, um, and it locks your, your file, and that's the file you're meant to use in production to ensure deterministic builds, but now you come along, you add another package, um, and the lock file doesn't actually lock, it's just its sub-dependencies, but it actually goes and rehashes your whole, your whole lock exactly. file. Yeah. So how have you guys got a, around that in, on, on Heroku or? So uh, you mean when we, well, at first, like I said, with, with a tool like, um, uh, what's that, the po Poetry, where it doesn't assume, it forces you to choose which version you want to pin. So then you know in your lock file that you have this particular version. So what we do is we just make sure that we, when we actually install everything, we have no, we have like no wild cards and, and, and stuff like that. We know for sure, okay, we're using these particular versions. Yeah. So just don't don't be like, oh, pipin is great, pipin lock, and then ship it, and then you've got tons of packages with like these wildcard version numbers and things like that. Yeah. So, so just with with pipin, my advice would be, it there's been a lot of like marketing around it, making it seem like it's it's like the solution to everything, but just take it with a pinch of salt because there's people who've been bitten quite badly with that. So just. Still be careful while you're using while you're using uh, Pipenv. Great, thanks a lot, Daniel. Please give him a round of applause. <laughs>